as we try to explain the acoustics of uh, the vowels based on their articulation, we can make reference to our tube models uh, of resonators. The uh, neutral schwa vowel is produced with a vocal tract that doesn't have any constriction or expansion in a significant way. So we can treat it as uh, a half open resonating tube, open at the lips and closed at the larynx. In this case, the resonances should be odd multiples of the speed of sound divided by four times the length of the tube, given the appropriate wavelength to make a standing wave. The idea here is we take the uh, vocal tract from the larynx through the pharynx and the oral cavity, unbend that tube and consider it uh, to be modeled by a straight tube. The standing wave resonances for a half open tube can be represented by these images. The first format would be the lowest resonance one where the wavelength is four times the length of the tube, or in the case of a standing wave, one where one quarter of a complete wave fits within the tube. It has a node at the larynx end, which is closed, and an anti-node at the lips end, which is open. The second formant is the next odd multiple, so three times that first formant. Uh, that would be the next um, standing wave where, again, there's a node at the closed larynx end and an anti-node at the open lips end. In that second form at standing wave, there's another anti-node and node in the middle of the vocal tract. The third formant would be the um, fifth multiple of the first formant, uh, the next odd multiple. Again, this is the next frequency that creates a node at the closed end and an anti-node at the open end, and there are two additional nodes and anti-nodes in between. So based on the uh, size of typical humans, uh, we can get an estimate for what resonances we would expect from the neutral e uh, schwa vowel. Uh, for a vocal tract of 17 centimeters, we get a first formant of 506 hertz. We get that by taking the speed of sound, 34,400, dividing it by four times the length of the tube, so dividing it by four times 17, which is 68, uh, to get 506. Second formant would be three times that. Third formant would be five times that. Uh, for a typical female with a vocal tract of 14 centimeters, the first formant would be 614 hertz. The second formant three times that, and the third formant five times that. Um, for a supposed typical child, but of course children change quite a bit, uh, but we could say uh, for a small human with a vocal tract of 10 centimeters, we might have a first formant then of 860 hertz, a second formant three times that at 2580, and a third formant at five times that at 4300. When we move away from the neutral vowel and consider the point vowels, uh, the first dimension we can look at is high versus low vowels. Um, if one analyzes the acoustics of recordings of people producing these vowels, we find that high vowels will have a low first formant. So for example, for an E, something like 270 hertz. For an U, something like 300 hertz. For our um, typical male speaker, uh, that's been studied by acousticians. Low vowels, on the other end, have a high first formant. So, for example, an ah with a typical first formant of 730 hertz. The low F1 that we get for high vowels is caused by that constriction in the vocal tract, creating something known as a Helmholtz resonator, named after a German acoustics researcher named Helmholtz. The Helmholtz resonator is a bottle-shaped tube that results in an especially low resonance frequency relative to the, side of the size of the tube. So the Helmholtz resonator gives you a much lower frequency than you would predict given what the length of the tube is. 
their um, R mathematical equations that let you predict what frequency a Helmholtz resonator would have depends on the um, the length of the wider part of the tube, the length of the narrower part of the tube, and their relative cross-sectional areas. Doing all of that math doesn't really help increase our understanding of where the acoustics come from though, so we'll just take the simple step that when there's a Helmholtz resonator configuration, that will create a low formant. In the case of the high front vowel E, we get a tube model like the one on the left. Again, uh, we treat it as closed off at the larynx. Uh, open at the lips with a significant constriction in the front part of the vocal tract, uh, behind the alveolar ridge in the sort of palatal region. This creates a bottle shape out of the pharynx, um, which gives us a Helmholtz resonator and a low first formant. In the case of an oo, uh, the tongue body is raised and retracted, so that will make a constriction in the rear part of the vocal tract. Um, and uh, that constriction then creates a, a resonator in the pharynx region for that vowel as well. Oo also has lip rounding, and that constriction at the lips will create another bobble shape in the front part of the vocal cavity. Um, which uh, will give oo a low a second formant as well. Looking at uh, the dimension of front versus back in vowels, we find that front vowels have a relatively high second formant. For example, the high front vowel e uh, with a formant around 2300 hertz. Back vowels have a relatively low second formant something like 870 hertz for oo and 1100 hertz for ah, again for our sort of typical male speaker. The high second formant for front, front vowels comes from the fact that the tongue body makes up, takes up most of the vocal tract, leaving a relatively small area in the pharynx to resonate. Um, in addition to that Helmholtz resonator shape, uh, that pharyngeal cavity will act like a closed tube and have a separate resonance on the basis of the length of that tube, but since it's a relatively short tube, that will be a relatively high frequency. Back vowels pull the tongue into the pharynx, so most of the oral tract is open uh, to be a, um, uh, a resonating tube. Uh, that's a larger tube, so it will have a lower resonating frequency. Or in the case of back vowels that are rounded, there is lip rounding, which will create a second Helmholtz resonator, resulting in a low uh, second formant frequency. For the vowels that are in between these point vowels, um, they have uh, values for the first and second formants that are intermediate between these point vowel acoustic values but they generally follow the rules for point vowels. So we have um, more front vowels with a high F2, more back vowels with a low F2. Vowels nearer the high end with a lower F1, vowels nearer the lower end with a high F1. Um, in addition, our mid and low vowels vary less from front to back. That vowel quadrilateral um, isn't a square. It's wider at the top than it is at the bottom. So variation in F2 as we move down toward low vowels becomes less extreme. Uh, here is a vowel quadrilateral with the vowels laid out on it in sample locations uh, and our um, typical speaker corner vowel acoustics marked for E in the upper left, U in the upper right, and A uh in the lower right, where F1 and F2 follow um, the pattern of um, a high F1 for low vowels and a low F1 for high vowels, F2 being um, low for back vowels and high for front vowels. So those in-between vowels like uh, A or O are going to have a, a more intermediate F1 value because they're not extremely high, um, and also more intermediate F2 values because they're not quite as far front or back. 
another way of representing the expected acoustics for these vowels um, is through uh, what they would sort of look like on a spectrogram, where here the ovals are representative of the um, F1 and F2 values for those vowels. The high vowels are at the edges um, of this graph, so the E on the left and the U on the right, and they have the lowest F1 values. As we move to vowels that are lower, um, from E to I to A to E to A, the F1 values increase. As we go from U to vowels that are lower, U, O, A, and A, again the F1 values increase. And as we go from the highest um, uh, front vowel E um, toward uh, the other uh, front vowels which aren't as far front because they're lower in the quadrilateral, um, the second formant drops. And then as we move to more back vowels that second formant continues to lower uh, until we get to extreme back vowels. So we get this formant pattern where for the front vowels there's a separation between F1 and F2. For the back vowels, F1 and F2 are very close to each other, um, and also the lower that combination is, the higher the vowel is. So taking these generalizations, uh, if we look at the um, uh, non-script A, A vowel, that's the first half of the diphthongs of English in uh, the transcription system that most people use for English. Um, this vowel is a lot like the regular A ah vowel, but a little more forward in articulation. As a result, we could make a prediction about what we would find for formants. If it's equally low but more forward, that's going to affect this second formant, which is determined by front-back, not the first formant that's determined by up-down. And as we go more forward, the second formant becomes higher, so the correct answer would be uh, that we would expect a higher F2 than the regular A ah vowel. Here we have a recorded spectrogram um, of a fairly long word, and there is a vowel marked in the region of a time of about 0.6. Looking at this vowel, we can identify the first formant and the second formant, and note that we see some space in between. So among our corner vowels, we would expect this to be the E vowel. Uh, it's got a low F1 and a relatively high F2, resulting in a gap between the two. This vowel, on the other hand, uh, has F1 and F2 quite close to each other and also quite low. So among our corner vowels, um, we would expect that low F1 to be associated with a high vowel, but that low F2 to be associated with a back vowel. So we would expect that to be OO. The most challenging vowel uh, is this first one here. Um, F1 looks to be uh, around uh, 750 hertz. Uh, let's say maybe 700 hertz. Um, F2 is in the 1400 or so range, and um, F3 looks like it's up around maybe 2200 hertz. There's not a lot of separation between F1 and F2, but there is a little bit. Um, uh, at this stage in uh, your preparation especially, it's difficult to decide whether what you're dealing with here is the neutral vowel uh or the uh, low back vowel ah, because the formants are pretty close to each other, um, but the first formant is relatively high. Uh, in this case, I believe, due to the relatively even spacing of the formant pattern, this is more likely to be an uh, that neutral vowel.